This year marks 2,000 years since the death of the Roman poet Ovid, one of the greatest storytellers of all time. His metamorphoses, with its mythological tales of transformations, has transfixed readers and inspired artists ever since, including William Shakespeare. I'm Greg Doran, Artistic Director of the Royal Shakespeare Company, and this autumn we're looking at Ovid's influence on our house playwright. One contemporary wrote, the witty soul of Ovid lives in mellifluous and honey-tongued Shakespeare. I've been working with a group of actors to explore some of the key stories from the Metamorphoses, translated by Ted Hughes, amongst others. First up is Simon Russell Beale, with a speech by Ovid's sorceress Medea. Here she proclaims her power to rule over nature and shows the full extent of her magical witchcraft. References to Medea occur in plays like The Merchant of Venice and Titus Andronicus, and the tale even inspired a famous passage from The Tempest. Ye airs and winds, ye elves of hills, of brooks, of woods alone, of standing lakes, and of the night, approach ye everyone, through help of whom the crooked banks much wondering at the thing. I have compelled streams to run clean backward to their spring, by charms I make the calm seas rough, and make the rough seas plain, and cover all the sky with clouds, and chase them thence again. By charms I raise and lay the winds, and burst the viper's jaw, and from the bowels of the earth both stones and trees do draw. Whole woods and forests I remove, I make the mountains shake, and even the earth itself to groan and fearfully to quake. I call up dead men from their graves, and thee, O lightsome moon, I darken oft, though beaten brass abate thy peril soon. Our sorcery dims the morning fair, and darks the sun at noon. The flaming breath of fiery bulls ye quenched for my sake, and caused their unwieldy necks the bended yoke to take. Among the earth-bred brothers you a mortal war did set, and brought asleep the dragon fell whose eyes were never shut. There is, right at the end of Shakespeare's career, in the last solely authored play, the, the Tempest, there is a very, very direct borrowing from Ovid. In fact, it's from Medea. And I remember us, when we were rehearsing The Tempest last year, reading that, um, and it being a bit of a surprise. Yeah. Ye elves of hills, brooks, standing lakes and groves. So what Shakespeare's done, it's always fascinating what he does with this source material, isn't he? He sort of smooths the argument so it has a, a good, wonderful, Porsche-like Rolls-Royce acceleration through the speech. Of course, the two most, or three most, four most famous lines in the speech are in fact entirely Shakespeare's invention, which is when uh, Prospero breaks his staff and gives up his powers. But it means that the speech has a different, has a regret about it has a self-congratulatory element, of course, but it's also about what I did in the past and what I'm now going to give up, which is a whole different tone to Medea thundering against, uh, you know, flexing her muscles against her own miserable situation. But this rough magic I hear abjure. And when I have required some heavenly music, which even now I do to work mine end upon their senses that this airy charm is for, I'll break my staff. Bury it. Certain fathoms in the earth and deeper than did ever plummet sound. I'll drown my book. I mean, it's a wonderful speech, and I enjoy playing it, as you know, more than I can say. One of the most heartbreaking stories from the Metamorphoses is the tale of Proserpina. While gathering flowers one day, she's snatched away by the Lord of Hell to be his wife in the underworld. As Hannah Morris here narrates from the peerless translation by Ted Hughes, Proserpina's mother Ceres, the goddess of the harvest, tries to rescue her, but the young girl's simple act of eating a pomegranate traps her in hell for half the year. 
Shakespeare echoes Proserpina's flower gathering in characters like Ophelia and Perdita in The Winter's Tale. Near Enna's walls is a deep lake known as Pagusa. Trees encircling it knit their boughs to protect it from the sun's flame. Their leaves nurse a glade of cool shade where it is always spring with spring's flowers. Proserpina was playing in that glade with her companions, brilliant as butterflies. They flitted hither and thither excitedly among lilies and violets. She was heaping the fold of her dress with the flowers, hurrying to pick more, to gather most, piling more than any of her friends into baskets. There, the Lord of Hell suddenly saw her. In the sweep of a single glance, he fell in love and snatched her away. Love pauses for nothing. Terrified, she screamed for her mother and screamed to her friends, but louder and again and again to her mother. She ripped her frock from her throat downwards, so all her cherished flowers scattered in a shower. Then, in her childishness, she screamed for her flowers as they fell, while her ravisher leapt with her into his chariot. They were gone, leaving the ripped turf and the shocked faces. In despair, Ceres ransacked the earth. No dawn sodden with dew ever found her resting. The evening star never found her weary. The lands and the seas across which Ceres roamed make too long a list. Searching the whole earth, she found herself right back where she had started, Sicily. She ripped her hair out in knots. She hammered her breasts with her clenched fists. Yet still she knew nothing of where her daughter might be. She accused every country on earth, reproached them all for their ingratitude, called them unworthy of their harvests. Then Arethusa, the nymph that Alpheus loved, lifted her head from her pool, swept back her streaming hair and called to Ceres, great mother of earth's harvests, you who have searched through the whole world for your vanished daughter, you have labored enough, but have raged too much against the earth, which was always loyal to you. The earth is innocent, while I was under the earth, as I slid through the Stygian pool in the underworld, I felt myself reflecting a face that looked down at me. It was your Proserpina. She was not happy. Her face was pinched with fear. Nevertheless, she was a great queen, the greatest in that kingdom of spectres. She is the reigning consort of Hell's tyrant. Ceres seemed to be turning to stone as she listened. For a long time she was like stone. Then her stupor was shattered by a scream of fury as she leapt into her chariot. Jupiter was astonished when she materialized in front of him, her hair one wild snarl of disarray, her face inflamed and swollen with sobbing, and her voice hacking at him, attacking. She is your daughter, not only mine, but yours too. You have to do something. If her mother's pleas are powerless, maybe her father's heart will stir for her. The high god answered calmly. I love our daughter no less than you too. I am bound to her by blood no less than you are, but see things as they stand. Let your words fit the facts. Is this a theft or an act of love? Once you accept him, this is a son-in-law to be proud of. Even if he were worthless, he is still the brother of Jupiter. As it is, in everything he is my equal, only not so lucky in the lottery that gave heaven to me and hell to him. Still, if you are determined to take her from him, you can have her, but on one condition. The sole condition, fixed by the fates, is this. She can return to heaven on condition, hear me, on condition, that she never tasted hell's food. Jupiter finished and Ceres was away to collect her daughter. But the fates stopped her. Proserpina had eaten something. Absently straying through Pluto's overloaded orchard, she had plucked a pomegranate, picked its hard rind open, and sucked the glassy flesh from seven seeds, almost nothing, but more than enough. So, closing Hell's gates on Proserpina. Now Jupiter intervened between his brother and his grieving sister. He parted the years round into two halves. 
From this day, Proserpina, the goddess who shares both kingdoms, divides her year between her husband in hell among spectres and her mother on earth among flowers. Her nature too is divided, one moment gloomy as hell's king, but the next bright as the sun's mass, bursting from clouds. Of course, at the end of the Proserpina story, so she has been dragged down to the underworld. Um, her mother, Ceres, um, rampages the earth, causing devastation to try and find her daughter, eventually discovers that she has been taken down to the underworld and pleads with Jupiter um, to release her. And he says, yes, you can release her on one condition that she hasn't eat and eaten anything while she was in the underworld. And lo and behold, we discover that she's had seven pips, seven little seeds from a pomegranate. Um, and therefore, she can't come back. But the, the deal is made that she can come back for six months of the year. Six months she has to spend in winter in her gloom, and six months she can spend in the flowery summer when her whole personality changes. It makes her quite schizophrenic as a personality. It's the worst custody settlement of all time. <laughs> like poor, this poor girl, I don't have to go down there. I tell her it's really cold down there. There's spectres and there's devils. I much prefer it at your place. You know, don't make me go, don't make me go. The most gruesome tale in the Metamorphoses must be Philomel and Terius about a king so overcome by lust for his wife's sister that he rapes her. With a plot that heavily influenced Titus Andronicus, a play currently in performance at the RSC, the story describes King Terius ripping out Philomel's tongue so she can tell no one what happened, but she manages to inform her sister, the Queen Procne, and they conspire to murder the king's son, Itis, and serve him up to his father cooked in a pie. Anthony Byrne tells the whole story here, which will climax in the transformation of the three protagonists, Terius, Philomel, and Procne, into birds. When Terius, the great king of Thrace, married Procne and begot Itis, Procne spoke to her husband, stroking his face. If you love me, give me the perfect gift, the sight of my sister. At a command from Terius, oar and sail brought him to Athens. Terius began to explain his unexpected arrival, how Procne longed for one glimpse of her sister. But just as he was promising the immediate return of Philomela, there, mid-sentence, Philomela herself, arrayed in the wealth of a kingdom, entered, still unaware that her own beauty was the most astounding of her jewels. Tarius felt his blood alter thickly. His first thought was simply to grab her and carry her off and fight to keep her. The sun went down. A royal banquet glittered and steamed. The guests, replete, slept. Only the Thracian king Tarius tossed, remembering Philomela's every gesture, remembering her lips. Her voice, her hair, her glances, and seeming to see every part her garments concealed, just as he wanted it. So he fed his lust and stared at the darkness. The oar was bent, and the wake broadened behind the painted ship. Philomela watched the land sinking, but Terius laughed softly. I've won. My prayers are granted. She's mine. The moment the ship touched his own shore, Terius lifted Philomela onto a horse and hurried her to a fort behind high walls hidden in deep forest. And there he imprisoned her. Bewildered and defenseless, failing to understand anything and in a growing fear of everything, she begged him to bring her to her sister. His answer was to rape her, ignoring her screams to her father, to her sister, to the gods. Afterwards, she crouched in a heap, shuddering. 
She clawed her hair and pounded her breasts with a fist, shrieking at him. You disgusting savage. You sadistic monster. The gods are watching. If they bother to notice what has happened, if they are more than the puffs of air that go with their names, then you will answer for this. And shame will not stop me. I shall tell everything to your own people. Yes, to all Thrace. Even if you keep me here, every leaf in this forest will become a tongue to tell my story. The dumb rocks will witness. All heaven will be my jury. Every god in heaven will judge you. Terius was astonished to be defied, enraged at, and insulted by a human being. He hauled her up by the hair, twisted her arms behind her back and bound them, then drew his sword as he caught her tongue with bronze pincers, dragged it out to its full length, and cut it off at the root. The stump recoiled, silenced, into the back of her throat. But the tongue squirmed in the dust, babbling on, shaping words that were now soundless. Then, stuffing the whole hideous business deep among his secrets, he came home smooth-faced to his wife. When she asked for her sister, he gave her the tale he had prepared. She was dead. His grief as he wept convinced everybody. A year went by. Philomela, staring at the massive stone walls and stared at by her guards, was still helpless. She set up a Thracian loom and wove on a white fabric scarlet symbols that told in detail what had happened to her. A servant who understood her gestures but knew nothing of what she carried took this gift to Procne, the queen. The tyrant's wife unrolled the tapestry and saw the only interpretation was the ruin of her life. In those moments, her restraint was superhuman. But grief, so sudden, so huge, made mere words seem paltry. And tears were pushed aside by the devouring single idea of revenge. Now came the festival of Bacchus, celebrated every third year by the young women of Thrace, dressed as a worshipper. Procne joined the uproar, berserk. She hurled herself through the darkness, terrifying. So she found the hidden fort in the forest. With howls to the god, her troop tore down the gate, and Procne freed her sister, disguised her as a bacchante, and brought her home to the palace. She was out of her mind with anger. Oh, my sister, nothing now can soften the death. Terius is going to die. Let me break his jaw. Hang him up by his tongue and saw it through with a broken knife. Then dig his eyes from their holes. Oh, however we kill him, our revenge has to be something that will appall heaven and hell and stupefy the earth. While Procne raved, Itis came in. A demented idea caught hold of his image. The double of his father, she whispered. Silent, her heart ice, she saw what had to be done. Nevertheless, as he ran to her, calling to her, his five-year-old arms pulling at her to be kissed, and to kiss her, and chattering lovingly through his loving laughter, her heart shrank. She felt her love for this child softening her ferocious will. And she turned to harden it, staring at her sister's face. Then looked back at Itis, and again at her sister, crying, he tells me all his love, but she has no tongue to utter a word of hers. He can call me mother, but she cannot call me sister. Catching Itis by the arm, she gave herself no more time to weaken. He saw what was coming. He tried to clasp her neck, screaming, Mama, Mama. But staring into his face, Procne pushed a sword through his chest. Then 
Though that wound was fatal enough, slashed his throat. Now the two sisters ripped the hot little body into pulsating gobbets. The room was awash with blood as they cooked his remains. A feast followed. Progne invited one guest only, her husband. Terius, ignorant and happy, lolled on the throne of his ancestors and swallowed with smiles all his posterity as Procne served it up. He was so happy he called for his son to join him. Where's Itis? Bring him. Procne could not restrain herself any longer. Your son, she said, is here already. He's here, inside. He could not be closer to you. Terius was mystified. He suspected some joke. Perhaps Itis was hiding under his throne. Itis, he called again. Come out, show yourself. The doors banged wide open. Philomela burst into the throne room, her hair and gown bloody. She rushed forward and her dismembering hands, red to the elbows, jammed into the face of Terius, a crimson dripping ball. The head of Itis. He tugged at his ribcage as if he might writhe himself open to empty out what he had eaten. He staggered about, sobbing that he was the tomb of his boy, then gripped his sword hilt and steadied himself. As he saw the sisters running, he came after them, and they who had been running seemed to be flying. And suddenly they were flying, and Terius charging blind in his delirium of grief and vengeance, no longer caring what happened. He too was suddenly flying. On his head and shoulders, a crest of feathers. Instead of a sword, a long curved beak, like a warrior transfigured with battle frenzy, dashing into battle. He had become a hoopoe. Philomela mourned in the forest, a nightingale. Procne lamented round and round the palace. A swallow. Both you are currently in Titus Andronicus. It's, it must have been quite interesting seeing just how closely um, the, 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 the story reflects the play. There is something about the, the language of it and the words that he uses and the... Um, Possibly it is the Ovid as well as Ted Hughes, but the getting inside the mind of Procne, mm. the rage, and inside the, the terror of Philomel. I just, I couldn't stop crying. It's such, it's such an amazing story. What Shakespeare doesn't do that Ovid does is allow the metamorphosis of Lavinia that Philomel has. She is able to release from her suffering and her pain through becoming a, a, a nightingale and having that sort of transcendence. Titus Andronicus really pushes it, doesn't it? A, a, a girl is raped, she has her hands cut off, she has her tongue cut out. That, that, that's pretty extreme. Have you, have you encountered responses of, um, from the audience? Yeah, I spoke to a, a group of American students who were really disconcerted that there weren't any trigger warnings. And I didn't know what they meant. And they had to explain to me now that, uh, is this right for, for live theatre and movies in the States? There is a warning before you go in, explicitly saying there are things that will happen in this thematically which might trigger an uncomfortable emotional response in you. In, in, in 2015, students at the University of Columbia petitioned the staff, um, apparently, that certain stories should be prefaced with, uh, and these were Ovid's metamorphoses, so Terius and Philomel was one of them, that there should be a trigger warning alerting readers who might be disturbed by their violent sexual content. Um, it's interesting, isn't it, that, 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 that Ovid has that power in the yeah. 21st century? Yeah. Ovid's metamorphoses have offered inspiration to some of the greatest artists in history. 
perhaps most memorably, with the story of the hunter Actaeon, depicted in the vivid canvases of Titian. As Alex Waldman reveals here, after accidentally catching sight of the goddess of the hunt, Diana, naked at her bath, Actaeon is transformed into a stag and devoured by his own hounds, a fate Shakespeare alludes to in passages from Twelfth Night and The Merry Wives of Windsor. Destiny, not guilt, was enough for Actaeon. There's no crime to lose your way in a dark wood. It happened on a mountain where hunters had slaughtered so many animals the slopes were patched red with the butchering places. When shadows were shortest and the sun's heat hardest, young Actaeon called a halt. <sighs> we have killed more than enough for the day. All concurred, and the hunt was over for the day. A deep cleft at the bottom of the mountain, dark with matted pine and spiky cypress, was known as Gargafi sacred to Diana, goddess of the hunt. Often to that grotto, aching and burning from her hunting, Diana came to cool the naked beauty she hid from the world. The goddess was there in her secret pool, naked and bowed under those cascades from the mouths of jars and the fastness of Gargafi, when Actaeon, making a beeline home from the hunt, stumbled on this gorge. Surprised to find it, he pushed into it, apprehensive but steered by a pitiless fate, whose nudgings he felt only as surges of curiosity. So he came to the clearing. He peered into the gloom to see the waterfall. But what he saw were nymphs, their wild faces screaming at him in a commotion of water. And as his eyes adjusted, he saw they were naked, beating their breasts as they screamed at him. And he saw they were crowding together to hide something from him. He stared harder. Those nymphs could not conceal Diana's whiteness. The tallest barely reached her navel. Actium stared at the goddess, who stared at him. She twisted her breasts away, showing him her back, glaring at him over her shoulder. She blushed like a dawn cloud in that twilight grotto of winking reflections and raged for a weapon, for her arrows to dry through his body. No weapon was to hand, only water, so she scooped up a handful and dashed it into his astonished eyes as she shouted, Now, if you can, tell how you saw me naked. That was all she said. But as she said it, out of his forehead burst a rack of antlers. His neck lengthened, narrowed, and his ears folded to whiskery points. His hands were hooves, his arms long slender legs, his hunter's tunic slid from his dappled hide. With all this, the goddess poured a shocking stream of panic terror through his heart like blood. Actaeon bounded out across the cave's pool in plunging leaps, amazed at his own lightness. And there, clear in the bulging mirror of his bow wave, he glimpsed his antlered head and cried, What has happened to me? No words came. No sound came but a groan. His only voice was a groan. But then, as he circled, his own hounds found him. The first to give tongue were Melampus and the Spartan Cretan crossbreeds, Lebrus and Agriodus, Hylacta with the high cracked voice and a host of others, too many to name. The strung out pack locked onto their quarry, flowed across the landscape over crags, over cliffs where no man could have followed, through places that seemed impossible, where Actaeon had so often strained every hound to catch and kill the quarry. Now he strained to shake the same hounds off his own hounds. He tried to cry out, I am Actaeon, remember your master. But his tongue lolled wordless, while the air belabored his ears with hounds' voices. Suddenly, three hounds appeared ahead, raving towards him. They had been last in the pack, but they had thought it out and made a shortcut over a mountain. As Actaeon turned, 
Melanchates, the ringleader of this breakaway trio, grabbed a rear ankle in the trap of his jaws. These three pinned their master as the pack poured onto him like an avalanche. Every hound filled its jaws till there was hardly a mouth not gagged and crammed with hair and muscle. Then began the tugging and the ripping. Actium's groan was neither human nor the natural sound of a stag. Now the hills he had played on so happily toyed with the echoes of his death noises, his head and antlers reared from the heaving pile. But his friends, who had followed the pack to this unexpected kill, urged them to finish the work. Meanwhile, they shouted for Actian. Over and over for Actian to hurry and witness this last kill of the day and such a magnificent beast. As if he were absent. He heard his name and wished he were as far off as they thought him. Only when Actian's life had been torn from his bones to the last mouthful. Only then did the remorseless anger of Diana, goddess of the arrow, find peace. It wasn't Actian's fault that no. he strayed into that cavern and, and saw Diana uh, bathing. It, it, it's though that, that beautiful image that Titian paints so beautifully of Actian uh, witnessing um, Diana and her nymphs and then being turned into a stag. The attempt to try and get inside what it must feel like as a human being, to try and get right inside the human condition, it's, it's the humanity, is that, that yes. you always like, what's it like to feel like that person at that moment with that happening to yes. you, that moment of extremists happening to you? I guess perhaps that's why, that's what myths are about. It's, an, it's the ability to, to explore the human condition and human experience and try and articulate what that actually means. Mm. But the image of uh, Actaeon is used in, in Twelfth Night, for instance, without any reference to the name Actaeon, as Orsino describes his passion for the Countess Olivia. Ovid's stories provide morals in their narrative. In the tale of Niobe, the proud Phrygian queen is brought to her knees when she tells the world that she is more fortunate than the goddess Leto, because Niobe has 14 children and Leto only two. In Nia Gwyn's telling of the tale here, we see that once Leto has effected the destruction of Niobe's entire family, the grief of the bereaved queen is so great that she is transformed into a weeping mountain. All tears, as Hamlet says, forevermore. Niobe was proud. She was proud of the magical powers of her husband, Amphion, the king. Her greatest pride was her family her 14 children. And it is true, Niobe of all mothers would have been the most blessed if only she had not boasted that she of all mothers was the most blessed. She looked magnificent, like a great flame in her robes of golden tissue. She reared her spectacular head, her hair coiled and piled like a serpent asleep on a heap of jewels. All Phrygia kneels and pays homage to me. Wherever my eyes rest in my house, they rest on fabulous wealth. Nor can it be denied, my own beauty is not equaled on any face in heaven. Tell me, how can I fear ill fortune? Even if it came to the worst, if I lost some of my children, I could never be left with only two. Only two! Two is all that Leto ever had. Two children, you might as well have none. Get rid of these laurels. Back to your homes. Finish with this nonsense. Finish, I say. Leto was enraged. She climbed to the top of Synthus and cried out to her children, the twins, none other than Apollo and Diana, so lightly dismissed by the Phrygian queen. Your mother is calling you, she cried. Your mother, who is so proud of being your mother. In heaven, I take second place to none except Juno herself. Your mother's divinity is being denied. The daughter of Tantalus has inherited all her father's blasphemous folly. 
She has not only emptied my temples, she drives me mad with insults, derision, and tells the whole world her 14 children are a thousand times superior to my two. Compared to her, I am childless. Oh, my children, double her mockery back into her mouth. Let her swallow its meaning. Leto would have gone on, but her great son, Apollo, spoke. Mother, your words merely prolong Niobe's delusion. He exchanged a signal with his sister. Together they sailed through the sky like an eclipse in a cloud till they hung over the city of Cadmus. Outside the city, a broad plain smoked like a burning ground. Niobe's sons were out there, astride gaudy saddlecloths. Ismenus, Niobe's eldest, was reining his horse hard, bringing it round in a tight circle when his spine snapped and a bellow forced his mouth open as a broad-headed, bright red arrow came clean through him. The reins fell loose. For a moment, he embraced the horse's neck limply, then slid from its right shoulder. Ileonius was last. He dropped to his knees and lifted his arms. You guards, he cried. All of you, hear me, spare me, protect me. But the wound was instantly fatal, surgical, precise, minimal. It stopped his heart before he felt the impact. Now the news came looking for Niobe. Rumour, like an electrical storm wind, whisking at the street corners, people huddling together, then scattering in an uproar of wails, till at last her own family burst in on her, shrieking. This was no longer Niobe the Queen, who had driven her people as with a whip from Leto's altars. Now even those who hated her pitied her. She bowed over the cooling bodies of her sons. She kissed them as if she could give them a lifetime of kisses in these moments. She lifted her bruised arms. Leto, she cried, feast yourself on your triumph, which is my misery. I have died seven deaths at your hands. In each of these seven corpses, I died in agony and lie dead. Gloat and exult. And yet, your victory is petty. Though you've crushed me, I'm still far, far more fortunate than you are. I still have seven children. And even as she spoke, terror struck with an invisible arrow. The seven sisters of the dead brothers, stooped by the seven beers, loose hair over their shoulders, mourning. When six of them lay dead, Niobe grabbed the seventh and covered her with her limbs and body and tried to protect her in swathes of her robes, crying, Leave me my youngest. Leave me one. Leave me the smallest of all my children. Let me keep this one. But a slender arrow had already located the child she tried to hide and pray for. Nybe gazed at the corpses. All her children were dead. Her face hardened and whitened as the blood left it. Her very hair hardened like hair carved by a chisel. Her open eyes became stones. Her whole body a stone, life drained from every part of it, her tongue solidified in her stone mouth. Her feet could not move, her hands could not move, they were stone, all stone, packed in stone. And yet, this stone woman wept. A hurricane caught her up and carried her into Phrygia, her homeland, and set her down on top of a mountain. And there, a monument to herself, Niobe still weeps as the weather wears at her, her stone shape weeps. In the story, she's not exactly the most sympathetic character, is she? <laughs> no, she's not. And, and Niobe's crime is that she's proud and, and she boasts quite willingly uh, her pride and thus angers the goddess. And she has 14 children seven of each and she's extremely proud of them and she rather lamentably says i'm so fortunate i have so much and that fate could never touch me even if fate 
took from me most of my children. I could never be only left with two. Two is a pathetic yes. amount of children to have, like Leto. And Leto just happens to have two rather good And Leto's kids. two children are... Apollo and Apollo. Artemis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and so... It's, about, it's the wrong call to make, really, and... She's the tiger mum from hell. Yeah. <laughs> and as a consequence, her 14 children are... Executed. executed by Apollo and her grief is such that she then metamorphoses into a, a, a mountain and yet her grief is such that the, even the mountain weeps. It, it kind of goes beyond 3D, it's sort of, you know, you know, there's a sort of depth to it, it's almost all of a sudden you see Niobe kind of coming up and being there and the history of that story is alive to you as an audience, you know. No tale of Ovid's has permeated modern culture more than Echo and Narcissus, which reverberates throughout Twelfth Night and Romeo and Juliet, and has given us the term narcissism. Here, Fiona Shaw delivers Ted Hughes' version of this devastating story of the unrequited love of a nymph for a beautiful young man. In his 16th year, Narcissus, still a slender boy but already a man, infatuated many. His beauty had flowered, but something glassy about it. A pride kept all his admirers at a distance. None dared be familiar, let alone touch him. A day came out on the mountains. Narcissus was driving and netting and killing the deer when Echo saw him. Echo, who cannot be silent when another speaks. Echo, who cannot speak at all unless another has spoken. Echo, who always answers back. The moment Echo saw Narcissus, she was in love. She followed him like a starving wolf following a stag too strong to be tackled. And like a cat in winter at a fire, she could not edge close enough to what singed her and would burn her. She almost burst with longing to call out to him and somehow let him know how she felt. But she had to wait for some other to speak so she could snatch their last words with whatever sense they might lend her. It so happened, Narcissus had strayed apart from his companions. He hallooed them. Where are you? I'm here. And Echo caught at the syllables as if they were precious. I'm here, and I'm here, and I'm here. Narcissus looked around wildly. I'll stay here, he shouted. You, come to me. And come to me, shouted Echo. Come to me. To me. To me. To me. Narcissus stood baffled. Whether to stay or go. He began to run, calling as he ran, Stay there! But Echo cried back, weeping to utter it, Stay there! Stay there! Stay there! Narcissus stopped and listened. Then more quietly, Let's meet halfway. Come. And Echo eagerly repeated it. Come. But when she emerged from the undergrowth, her expression pleading, her arms raised to embrace him, 
Narcissus turned and ran. No! He cried, no! I would sooner be dead than let you touch me! Echo collapsed in sobs. Her voice lurched among the mountains. Touch me! Touch me! Touch me! Touch me! Touch me! I had a poster of Narcissus and Echo in my bedroom, one of those pre-Raphaelite posters, and I, I recently saw it again. I thought, my God, that must have been in my mind <laughs> since I was a teenager. I think Ovid is doing what all great writers do. I don't think there's anyone who hasn't got Narcissus in him or her. And there's probably no one who hasn't got Echo in him or her. It's about the capacity of the human mind to either be um, full of self-love or, or to chase somebody who is out of reach. So they're, they're both fantastic aspects of the human consciousness. I was interested in it because I thought it was about reply, that um, it's very good. Yeats does a lot of poems uh, where there's somebody speaking to somebody else and somebody in reply. And in that way, it goes back earlier than the Romans to the Greeks, really, that somehow truth lies somewhere between the two people responding. It's neither, they're not goodies and baddies. Everyone is merely a point of view. Perhaps the greatest set piece of the Metamorphoses is the tale of Phaeton, who longs to drive the chariot of his father, the sun god Phoebus, as it plots its course across the sky. As our group tells the story here, despite Phaeton's father begging him not to go, the impetuous sun sets out only to create a cataclysm of global proportions. Phaeton's tragic story haunts the imagination of Shakespeare's King Richard II and the 14-year-old Juliet. When Phaeton bragged about his father, Phoebus, the sun god, his friends mocked him. Your mother must be crazy, or you're crazy to believe her. How could the son be anyone's father? <laughs> In a rage of humiliation, Phaeton came to his mother, Clymen. They're all laughing at me, and I can't answer. What can I say? It's horrible. I, I have to stand like a dumb fool and be laughed at. If it's true, mother, he cried, if the son, the high god Phoebus, if he is my father, give me proof. Give me evidence that I belong to heaven. Then he embraced her. Either moved by her child's distress or piqued to defend her honour against the old rumour, Clymen responded. She stretched her arms to the son. I swear you are his child. You are the sun of that great star which lights up the whole world. If I lie, then I pray to go blind this moment and never again to see the light of day. Phaeton rushed out, his head ablaze with the idea of heaven. He crossed his own land and came to his father's dawn palace. He went straight into the royal presence, but had to stand back. The huge light was so fierce, he could not go near it. For there was the god. Phoebus, the sun, robed in purple and sitting on a throne of emeralds that blazed, splitting and refracting his flames. The boy stared, dumbfounded, dazed by the marvel of it all. Then the great god turned on him the gaze that misses nothing and spoke. Phaeton, my son. Yes, I call you my child. Or rather a man a father might be proud of. Why are you here? You must have come with a purpose. What is it? Phaeton replied, Oh God, O oh light of creation, O oh Phoebus, my father, if I may call you father, if Clymen is not protecting herself from some shame by claiming your name for me, give me the solid proof. Let it be known to the whole world that I am your son. Remove all doubt. His father doffed his crown of blinding light and, beckoning Phaeton closer, embraced him. Do not fear to call me father. Your mother told you the truth. To free yourself from doubt, ask me for something, anything. I promise you shall have it. And though I've never seen the lake in hell by which we gods in heaven make our oaths inviolable, call on that lake now to witness this oath of mine. 
Phoebus had barely finished before Phaeton asked for the chariot of the sun and one whole day driving the winged horses. His father recoiled. He almost cursed his own oath. His head shook as if it were trying to break its promise. Your foolish words, he said, show me the tragic folly of mine. If promises could be broken, I would break this. I would deny you nothing except this. No mortal could hope to manage those reins. Not even the gods are allowed to touch them. Only see how foolish you are. The most conceited of the gods knows better than to dream he could survive one day riding the burning axle tree. Even for me, it's not easy. Once they're fired up with the terrible burners that they stoke in their deep chests and a belch flame from their mouths and nostrils. Once their blood is up, they will hardly obey me. And they know me. Think again. Do not ask me for what will destroy you. You ask me for solid proof that you are my son. My fears for your life are proof solid enough. Look at me. If only your eyes could see through to my heart and see it sick with a father's distress. Choose anything else in creation. It's yours. But this one thing you have chosen, I dare not grant it. Choose again, Phaeton. Phaeton seemed not to have heard. He wanted nothing but to drive the chariot and horses of the sun. His father could find no other means to delay him. He led him out to the chariot. And as Phaeton stood there, light-headed with confidence, giddy with admiration of the miraculous workmanship and detail, Dawn opened her purple doors behind him, letting the roses spill from her chambers. When the sun god saw that, and the reddening sky and the waning moon seeming to thaw, he called the hours to yoke the horses. But now, as Phoebus anointed Phaeton with a medicinal blocker to protect him from the burning and fixed the crown of rays on the boy's head, he saw the tragedy to come and sighed. At least, if you can, stick to these instructions, my son. First, use the whip, not at all or lightly, but rein the team hard. It's not easy. Their whole inclination is to be gone. Second, Avoid careering over the whole five zones of heaven. Keep to the broad highway that curves within the three zones, temperate and tropic. Now, fortune go with you, and I pray she will take better care of you than you have taken care of yourself. But Phaeton, too drunk with his youth to listen, ignored the grieving god and leapt aboard, and catching the reins from his father's hands, joyfully thanked him. Pyrrhus. Aeus, Athan, Phlegon, the four winged horses stormed to be off. They burst upwards. They hurled themselves ahead of themselves. Winged hooves churning cloud. They outstripped those dawn winds from the east. But from the first moment, they felt something wrong with the chariot. The load was too light more like a light pinnace without ballast or cargo, without the deep, kneeled weight to hold a course, bucking and flipping at every wave, sliding away sidelong at every gust. The chariot bounced and was whisked about as if it were empty. When the horses felt this, they panicked. They swerved off the highway and plunged into trackless heaven. Their driver, rigid with fear, gripped the chariot rail. It was true. They had neither the strength nor the skill to manage those reins. And even if he could have controlled the wild heads of the horses, he did not know the route. For the first time, the stars of the plough smoked. And though the Arctic Ocean was forbidden to them, they strained to quench themselves in it. And now, Phaeton looked down from the zenith and saw the earth. So far below, so terrifyingly tiny, his whole body seemed suddenly bloodless. His knees wobbled, his eyes dazzled and darkened. He wished he had never seen his father's horses. He wished he had never learned who his father was. He wished his father had broken his promise. Meanwhile, the chariot bounded along like a ship under a gale. 
What could he do? Much of the sky was behind him, but always more ahead. Then the horses took off blindly, uncontrolled. They let their madness fling them this way and that over the sky. They dashed in among the stars, switching the chariot along like a whip tail. They swept low till the clouds boiled in their wake and the moon was astonished to see her brother's chariot below her. Earth began to burn, the summits first. Baked, the cracks gaped. All fields, all thickets, all crops were instant fuel. The land blazed briefly. In the one flare, noble cities were rendered to black stumps of burnt stone. Whole nations, in all their variety, were clouds of hot ashes blowing in the wind. Now Phaeton saw the whole world mapped with fire. He looked through flames and he breathed flames, flame in and flame out like a fire eater. As the chariot sparked white hot, he cowered from the showering cinders. His eyes streamed in the fire smoke and in the boiling darkness, he no longer knew where he was or where he was going. He hung on as he could and left everything to the horses. The earth cracked open and the unnatural light beamed down into hell, scaring the king and queen of that kingdom with their own terrific shadows. The Almighty, aroused, called on the gods, including Phoebus who had lent the chariot. He asked them to witness that heaven and earth could be saved only by what he now must do. He soared to the top of heaven, into the cockpit of thunder. From here, he would pour the clouds and roll the thunders and hurl bolts. But now, he was cloudless. There was not a drop of rain in all heaven. With a splitting crack of thunder, he lifted a bolt, poised it by his ear, then drove the barbed flash point blank into Phaeton. The explosion snuffed the ball of flame as it blew the chariot to fragments. Phaeton went spinning out of his life. The crazed horses scattered. They tore free with scraps of the yoke, trailing their broken reins. The wreckage fell through space. Shattered wheels gyrating far apart. Shards of the car, the stripped axle, bits of harness, all in slow motion, sprinkled through emptiness. Phaeton. Hair ablaze, a fiery speck lengthening a vapour trail, plunged towards the earth like a star falling and burning out on a clear night. His father mourned, hidden, eclipsed with sorrow. They say no sun showed on that day. The directness and the immediacy of the stories, and particularly if you hear someone reading it to you, it's like, it's, it's like Jack and Ori on acid. <laughs> In all of them, it feels that whatever crime the person may have committed, it's just the lesson that they have to learn. You know, if, if, if a Phaeton being taught by his dad not to borrow the car keys for the, for the weekend, yes. you know, it's just, it's quite extreme for the universe to sort of blow up around him. You know, it's certainly, he won't be asking to borrow the car keys again, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lovely quote that um, Ted Hughes himself said about what, why Shakespeare and, uh, and Ovid uh, have kind of parallels. He said that both of them were interested in passion, or rather in what a, a passion feels like to one possessed by it. Not just ordinary passion, but human passion in extremis. Passion where it combusts or levitates or mutates into an experience of the supernatural. Perhaps that's why, that's why we, we still read and we still need Ovid and we still need Shakespeare. And from Radio 3, three short plays exploring contemporary life in Russia. Fear and Loathing in Russia Today is available now. Here on BBC Four, a heartfelt film from Hull, celebrating skilled craftsmanship from boat builders to wood carvers. It's Handmade in Hull, next.